The final video segment of this lecture will consider shaders and in particular the initialization of shaders needed for the MyTest1 program. Let us first look at the entire OpenGL pipeline. We start with the geometry specified by the user program. That is acted upon by a vertex shader which we will be considering in this course and a number of other shaders that we will not be immediately talking about here, including the tessellation control shader and tessellation evaluation shader to tessellate primitives like spline patches, a geometry shader that can generate additional geometry. Thereafter, this comes to the rasterization part of OpenGL, which sets up the primitives, does some basic clipping, and does rasterization, which essentially takes the triangles and determines which pixels they should correspond to on the screen. In this course, we cover programmable vertex and fragment shaders. OpenGL at this time effectively only specifies the rasterizer, which is non-programmable. Everything else is determined by the user. Finally, that information comes to the fragment shader once OpenGL decides which pixels to turn on and off where a triangle goes in the 2D screen. Fragment shaders are called for those corresponding pixels. And you can also give it input information such as textures or image data, and you get in the final color. As I said before, besides vertex and fragment shaders, modern OpenGL also involves tessellation of spline patches and geometry shaders that can generate or remove geometry from the scene. However, those are not covered in this course, and we consider exclusively programmable vertex and fragment shaders. To summarize the simplified pipeline, the user-specified vertices, where vertex arrays, are processed in parallel by the vertex shader. Semantically, OpenGL is calling the vertex shader, the same vertex shader, separately for each of the different vertices. In fact, this high level of parallelism is one reason why graphics hardware is so fast and has now been adapted for a number of tasks that are not immediately relevant to graphics itself. The vertex shader transforms the vertex by applying the model view or the projection matrix as well as other operations. Thereafter, for each primitive, OpenGL rasterizes, determines which pixels on the screen it corresponds to, and generates a fragment for each pixel that the primitive covers. And then, again in parallel, for each of the fragments, you apply the fragment shader in parallel. This will typically do shading and lighting calculations. And OpenGL also handles the Z-buffer depth test by default, although it can be overwritten by the user. Let's now talk about the shader setup. Shaders must be initialized just like any program. Effectively, they are a program. This involves a sequence of steps. First, you have to be able to create the shader, vertex and fragment. You have to be able to compile the shader. You have to be able to attach the shader to the program link the program, and finally use the program. Note that in OpenGL, the shader source is just a sequence of strings. In fact, these strings can be specified in part of the OpenGL program. Thereafter, these strings are compiled on the fly while the program is running. And the same steps that you would use to compile a normal program are used to compile a shader. Here is the shader initialization code. I have this command init shaders, type is vertex or fragment, and file name is the file from which I'm reading the shader. But note that, that this is simply my convention, that I have the shaders in a file, I read the file, and I specify them to the OpenGL program. You could, as well as far as OpenGL is concerned, have the shader specified as part of the source text for the program. All it is doing is compiling the strings corresponding to the shader. So I create a shader of the appropriate type. I read the file name. This is my own text file read command. And I put it into a single string. Then I uh, have a character pointer to that string. 
and I define the shader source for this given shader with one string and with this uh, C string variable. Thereafter, I compile the shader. OpenGL allows me to check if the compilation is correct and actually give me a number of flags corresponding to the shader value. So I can check the compiled status, which I will put in the variable compiled. If compiled was fine, I actually print out a message saying that the compilation was fine and the shader can be used. I haven't shown that C out here in the interest of space. But if the compilation failed, then I will tell you what errors it encountered and I throw an exception which ends the program. Here is the code for linking the shader program. So I'm given a vertex shader and a fragment shader. I want to link them together and use them in a shader program. First, I need to create a new program. Then I have this variable linked. I attach the vertex shader to the program, the fragment shader to the program. Remember, both of these shaders are initialized and created by the function we saw earlier. I link the program and just as I can get the errors for the compilation of the shader, I can get errors in linking, which I put in the linked variable. If the variable thing is linked, I use the program directly. Otherwise, I say what errors are there and throw an exception. And finally, I print out that the shader program is successfully attached and linked. Here is my basic no-op vertex shader. This is written in GLSL, which is the high-level shading language used to write shaders. The output values from the vertex shader will be interpolated by the rasterizer and sent to the fragment shader by OpenGL. Notice that I am doing this now in OpenGL 3.1 and GLSL version 3.30. So the first line I specify is the version I'm using, which is version 3.30 core. If you modify it to something older, it will not work because the syntax is no longer relevant. Here are the shader inputs. So the layout location is zero, input vec3 of position. So remember that earlier we passed the position and color to the shader. This is how it interfaces with the shader. That means there will be a position and a color associated with each vertex. The shader output is this color. Remember the case is sensitive and so this is capital color. The shader also has uniform variables which are the same for each vertex. Remember that these are effectively varying variables that change for each vertex, but there are also uniform variables that can be stored only once for all of the vertices which are simply the model view and projection matrices. Just like normal C code, it starts with a main routine. And within the main routine, it's doing something very simple. The GL position, which is the position of the vertex, is just given by the position variable coming in for the vertex information, gets multiplied by the model view projection matrix times the model view matrix, times the position variable that I specified for the vertex, made into homogeneous coordinates. That's what the VEC4 is doing. You have the XYZ of the position and the W, which is equal to 1. Finally, the color is just passed through from the vertex to the fragment shader. So this is a very basic no-op vertex shader. Note that I need to explicitly specify the multiplication by the projection and model view matrices. Let us now look at the fragment shader. Again, I've specified version 3.30 core. The input is just the color that came from the vertex shader. There are no uniform variables. And there is an output, which is the fragment color, which will be actually displayed on the screen. And all that I say is that this fragment color is the input color, and I made it from RGB to RGBA simply by setting the alpha variable equal to 1. 